Well, hey there, native plant enthusiasts. This is Santino, Education Manager for Bowman's Wildflower Preserve, coming at you with our next nature note. So I am just outside our visitor center under the shade of our glorious magnolia tree here. Um, uh, as this is the only place that I see it, or one of the few places that I still see it in bloom at the preserve. Um, and this is a plant, our next nature note obviously, is one that's really provided me joy ever since I first learned of it. Um, it's been one of my favorite native plants, and so I thought I'd share that with you today. Before we jump into today's native plant, I want to say a huge thank you to all the folks who have subscribed to the channel recently. Um, we've seen some tremendous growth, um, and that's really, really wonderful. Um, if you enjoy these videos, want more of it, or think others would enjoy them, please like, comment, share, subscribe. I know you hear it all the time on pretty much every video you watch, but it really does go a long way to help um, the, the channel grow. And so thank you to everyone who's done that. And without further ado, let's jump into today's native plant. So what is today's native plant? It's none other than whoop, the cup plant. So the cup plant is one of my favorites for several reasons. Uh, in addition to the glorious yellow flowers, um, and despite the one I shared with you being quite small, it can reach heights of six feet or more, um, usually like six to 10 feet. Uh, the flowers are in bloom from, I'll say June through September. Each one will produce about 20 to 30 seeds if pollinated. Um, speaking of which, the flowers are an abundant resource, um, both with pollen and nectar, making it great for pollinators. And those seeds are great food for wildlife, including birds. And birds will also frequent the plant um, to pick off insects that visit and visit the flowers. Um, so the plant's scientific name, Silphium perfoliatum, um, means through the leaf, the perfoliatum epithet. And that's because the stem, as we can see here, um, comes right up through the leaves and it forms a little cup, which is how it got its common name. Um, these cups will fill and retain water, so wildlife will frequently visit the plant uh, just to enjoy a quick dip um, and drink, especially on these uh, hot summer days. Personally, I really enjoy the resemblance to sunflowers. These large yellow flowers really help show the composite nature of the flower. Um, if we take a look closely at the edges, we'll see that each of those petals is its own separate flower. These are called ray flowers. And for the cup plant, these have female characteristics. When fertilized, they'll produce seeds. And so each plant or each floral uh, head or each one of the cup plants individual or composite flowers, I should say, will produce about 20 to 30 seeds. If we look closer in the center, we'll see what's called the disc flowers, um, which have both male and female structures, but only the males, the stamens, are fertile. In addition to sexual reproduction via pollination, the cup plant can also spread clonally via rhizomes. Now you might ask, what is a rhizome? Um, it's basically the underground root system structure of the plant. So each plant will shoot one large root system straight down with spreading roots um, near the surface. And each one of those can then produce a tap root that'll drop down um, and form a new plant from that. And that's how they sprout clones. The fact that it has tap roots um, really makes the plant difficult to transplant and you're more successful adding this to your garden space from either seeds or plugs. Um, however, once established, it provides, as we mentioned earlier, great wildlife value and glorious summer color. When discussing the ornamental plant trade, we often talk about plants that were brought to America, um, either from Europe or Asia or the like. However, it's also important to remember that this trade happens both forwards and back, right? So we, uh, plants from America have also been introduced to Europe. Um, the cup plant was introduced to Germany back in 1762. Um, recently, as of, I'll say, the early 2000s, um, it has seen quite the rise in cultivation. Um, and as of 2004, a focus on it being used as a potential bioenergy crop has really increased. Um, in the year 2021, cup plant was cultivated in about 10,000 hectares of arable land um, on, in Germany, which was triple from the year previously. Now I know what you're thinking, what is 10,000 hectares of arable land? 
Well, um, that's about 38.6 square miles or 18,600 football fields for my uh, American friends. And I do mean football, not soccer. So currently Z maize, also known as corn, is one of our largest sources of biofuels. Um, other sources include things like wheat and sugar beets, as well as sugar cane. Um, and it's the fermentation of these starches and sugars that produces ethanol that we then turn into, um, I guess, ethanol or our biofuel. Um, with this recent rise in popularity as both a biofuel and potential feed crop, um, it's important to remember that, you know, what plants that are great, wonderful natives here um, have the potential to become invasive in other areas. Um, so cup plant has been spotted in several different European countries and 15 uh, of Germany's 16 federal states. And following some new EU legislation, both the Netherlands as well as Russia have classified cup plant as potentially invasive. Despite the potential invasive qualities that cup plant might have, um, it really does have a whole host of wonderful ecosystem benefits. Um, it really doesn't need a whole lot of pesticides or fertilizers once it gets established on a site um, or even in the early establishment time. Um, it can improve soil quality as well as reduce the risk of erosion. Um, it provides wonderful cover for things like small game and deer. It's super drought resistant um, and the fallen stems don't really impede any of the new growth that will come up uh, from the new shoots. In addition, it's super high in nutrient value. And as I said, it's recommended as a feed crop for both dairy as well as meat animals. The long, long bloom period we talked about from June through September um, really help make it worthwhile as honey production. So the European honeybee will visit this plant uh, to gather both pollen and nectar. And several studies have looked at the biogas or biomass yields from it. And on average, it produces about 16 tons of dry matter per hectare. All right, friends. Well, that just about wraps it up for me today. I hope you enjoyed this quick look into one of my favorite native plants of summer. Um, really, I, this was one I, I, I enjoy all season long, um, as well as my friend the bee here. Um, so if you, as I said, if you want more of this content, please be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. Um, and until next time, my friends, keep on experiencing what's natural and learn what's native. Take care.